dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. We've journeyed together through the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas about making decisions. We've learned about discernment, about counsel, about timing, and about so much else. And now it's the time to act. In this final segment of our series on making winning decisions with St. Thomas Aquinas, I want to look with you at the theology of the imperium or the command that our mind tells our will to make, getting us over the hurdle of constantly wonder whether or not we should do something and crossing the threshold of success. Well, I certainly hope you've all enjoyed our little series here on St. Thomas Aquinas. We're entering into our last class or our sixth module here in understanding the power of, well, the Catholic thought, actually. I mean, you could say it's the Bible, the Word of God, which of course it is, but read through the tradition of the Catholic Church and especially through St. Thomas Aquinas for things that are practical. And I realized that a lot of Christian workers, Christian business people, really don't think that their spirituality has much to say about the stresses, the anxieties, the risks, the thrills, and also the payoffs that our life and as business leaders can represent. And that really irritates me. <laughs> I mean, just because as a priest, I'm like, wait a second. I mean, whenever a priest is told that he's irrelevant, uh, he starts to get a little bit sensitive. Let's put it that way. And so to hear from good hearted people that, listen, all that you guys talk about is really good when I have someone die in my family or when I lose a pet or I don't know, some sort of catastrophe happens in your, ha in your family. But for the rest of my practical life, you really have nothing to say. Uh, that is simply really ignorant, honestly, on the part of the people who feel that way. And I can understand how that happens. I mean, if you just go to Mass every Sunday and you listen to a seven-minute homily by a boring speaker, <laughs> that you could be tempted to think, okay, that's what church is. It's kind of a nice thing that I have to do because I, I'm supposed to do it. But the real world is there where I, when I go through my workspace and I have to actually engage the, 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 the real drive within me and be shaped by a force that's stronger than me, okay, called the economy and called management and relationships. The, the practicality of trying to raise my children and get them into schools, that's where I'm focused. I think it's totally fine because your focus should be there. And those things are, are absolutely wonderful. But like, let's not at the same time think that all of that energy has nothing to do with spirituality or that your faith in Jesus Christ isn't supposed to transform all that for you. I mean, if you're, you're wasting your time, literally, if you're operating for eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, and for some of you, because I see you, I know you, 12 hours a day, you know, I, in, in, in a realm that doesn't have anything to do with your eternal salvation or with your, who you are deep down inside in the light of God. You're just really wasting your time and, and, you're, and you're also depriving the, the, the secular world of the beauty of your faith. I mean, let's think about this. Every moment that you don't take your faith into the workplace is another moment where the workplace is bereft of your faith. Now, just don't think about faith. Think about what faith does. It transforms you into somebody who's loving, someone who's patient, someone who's virtuous, someone who's honest, someone who's visionary about new things because you have confidence in God. I mean, having faith is a big deal. And having a Christian who's operating out of their faith ought to be a blessing for any workspace environment. The way that we treat one another on the construction site, the language that we use, the attitude we take towards honesty, treating our materials well, cleaning up after our job is done. I mean, not damaging the stuff, being careful with our work breaks to not be uh, dishonest towards the company. I mean, there's all kinds of things that of the moral fabric that uh, of a person and of an organization that the Christian faith as edifies, builds up, strengthens. And if we lose that because Christians decide that their Christianity has nothing to do with their work, well, the workspace itself is going to be the first one to suffer. 
Okay, so like we owe it to the world to make this bold proclamation. God so loved the world that he sent me into it. And that's why for us to take a look at the practicality of our faith and say, our faith actually means a lot for the practical day-to-day -day choices that I have to make benefits us and it also benefits the world that we operate in, okay? So I want to take another, another step further here, a final step in understanding this. So I'm looking at the Summa of, of St. Thomas Aquinas. It's a writing that he did, wherein he outlines the truth about our choices. And he kind of like says there's six parts to making a choice. And I want to take a look at the last part about making a choice, about, about the means of how we're supposed to act. And it's called the, the command. The Latin word that he uses here is imperium, I-M-P-E-R-I-U-M, -E imperium, kind of like the word imperial that we get that from, or emperor, and it literally is, it comes from the Latin word meaning to command, okay? And he says that there's a moment that we all come to when we've thought things through, we've really owned our desires from the inside, and we're now we say, I've figured out the what I want to do, and I'm going to make an act inside of my heart to engage myself to do it. And obviously, for a lot of us, that's just natural. You don't even think about it because you're all doers. That's why you're sitting here in front of me. You're successful and you're, you're nailing it every single day because you get, up, you get up thinking about your work. And then you go and, okay, but there are other people who don't. And if, you, if they work for you, you know how difficult this type of person is. They just, they think about it, they talk about it, they hang around the water cooler, telling tales, you know, but they don't do the grind. And it's because in the end, well, something's getting in between all that they have on the inside of them and the, the necessary act that they have to pose outside of them. When we work, we pass from the inner world of knowing things to the outer world of doing things. But to pass from the inner to the outer, you've got to go through a door. That doorway is what Aquinas lays out for us as an action called an imperium. It's an act of command, right? And so for some people, you are born this way and you're just amazing and you are the master and commander of your life, right? And you got no problem saying, I will do this. Then I will. Others though, and especially you notice this if they're around you, they actually have this impaired. There's something that can block that imperium. And if you've seen it with your children who just can't seem to get up off of the couch <laughs> or an executive that just can't seem to pull the, the, the trigger and make a decision, even though we've planned to plan to thought it out, there's th that impairment can make or break the success of a business. We have to be able to stop the planning at a certain point and say, I will do this now. Okay, so Nike took, a, took this, of course, the business Nike took this to an extreme and made it their, their company motto. And it's a great motto. It's called Just Do It, right? Just Do It. It's a great motto, very successful advertising campaign because it effectively speaks to this particular act, a command by the mind to the will that says, do this, make this happen, okay? And that once that command is given, well, then I, my will can engage my, my, my faculties, my talents, my skills, and those can then in turn produce the result that I'm looking for. But it all begins on the inside of the heart, a moment there where you pull the trigger, you light the flame, you burn your ship, you walk across the gangplank, you say, this is where I stand. And that action is claimed by Christ. That action is where we meet Jesus in a very unique way. And I want to tell you more about it. Would you like to hear more from Father Nathan? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a two-minute glance at the gospel every Sunday morning right to your phone. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. Anyone who's in a position of leadership has to constantly deal right in the concrete with helping other people to move from being in a state of passivity to being in a state of action, right? That's the whole idea of leadership. It's leadership is not just influencing people by, by making them think happy thoughts. Leadership is about influencing action one way or the other. And sometimes it's very immediate and sometimes it's very remote. But in the end, leadership is about action. I'm here to help you to move. Well, if that's the case, then we need to be very attentive to what blocks people from actually taking that next step. 
right? And Aquinas here lays it out very beautifully. He says that the act of command, the act of saying, do this, is both an act of the will and an act of reason, right? So when we think of reason, think about the mind, the intelligence, right? And he says it's both. It's an act of the will because it's an inclination that you have towards motion, okay? So whenever he speaks about will, he speaks about will as a kind of like table that you can tilt. And if you tilt the table and you put a ball on the table, well, the ball is gonna roll down in the direction that, that the table is tilted. And he says, that's how the will works. The will is wherein you are a person is suddenly inclined to, to, to move in a certain direction. Okay, so when someone rocks your world, right? It means that you are now moved and influenced by them. Or when someone is upset, it means that their inner balance is thrown off and they're going to follow in a different path than what they had uh, intended. It's a, we have to use imagery because in the end, it's difficult to speak of the will just in purely uh, intellectual terms. But that imagery is a powerful one because for Aquinas, he says that once you can get a person to be inclined towards motion on the outside, the motion flows, right? So there's a lot of work we can do as a parent, as a spouse, as a leader, trying to influence the people around us into action by allowing them on the inside to be disposed to that action. And there's a whole science to that, of course, right? Getting people to want for, their, for themselves the thing that you need them to do or the thing that you'd like to have them do. But this is, at the same time, the most powerful form of leadership because then the person is doing it freely. They're doing it profoundly and they go above and beyond the, the anything that we could ask them to do just from the outside, okay? So it, it's like that the old story that I, when I was learning how to teach, I'd ask the mentor about discipline. How do you discipline a student? And, and the, the teacher told a story. She said, well, one time there was a student who uh, suddenly in the middle of class just stood up and the teacher told that student, sit back down. And the student said, no. And the teacher said, you must sit down. And the teacher and the student said, I don't want to. And then the teacher said, if you don't sit down, you'll fail. I'll suspend you from class. Terrible things will happen. And so the student sat down. And then the teacher looked smugly at the student and said, there, I knew you would sit down. And the student responded, well, I'm sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm still standing. And the teacher was using that to me, the mentor was using that to teach me as a new teacher that we have more to do than just control the classroom from the outside. Of course, it's very important, <laughs> but that's not, that's not just it, right? Leadership is about getting the students to want to learn when you're a teacher. How do I get them to not want to stand up and cause a disruption? Because they, they're so enthralled with the process of what I've got going on in front of them. When we can do that, we can win both games. We can both have a controlled classroom, but we can also really have students being educated, right? Well, that's a whole different science. Now, it's the same thing with parenting. It's the same thing in management. To get that kind of explosive productivity out of, out of your office staff, right? Where people clean up the, their workspaces and, and they're honest and they, they, they watch out each other's backs and they're supportive and they treat your clients the way that you would love for them to be treated. Oh my goodness, wouldn't that just be a dream? I mean, you've gone to school for oral surgery, you've studied this, you've perfected the art, and, and then the people don't want to come to, to you to get your surgery done because your office staff is negligent and your office is not cleaned and the people don't call them back and you've got all kinds of problems and you say, Kali, I signed up to be a great surgeon and I'm ending up failing because I'm a bad business leader. And I said, well, it's, it could be the case. We don't want that to be the case though, right? So what do you have to do? How do you get an office staff to go beyond what is the minimal required for them and to achieve excellence and, to, and that kind of productivity where they're laboring with you? Well, Aquinas would say, remember it's an act of the will. You've got to dispose inside what's keeping them back from doing that. And there could be all kinds of things. Like, for example, an office staff that doesn't feel like it's greeted 
by you when you come in or respected by are they paid enough is there are do they have desks that they like have you given them training to show them value in their positions i know they said that they could do it right everyone says that they could do it but it's one thing to say you can do it another thing to say my boss wants me to do it even better my boss is going to help me to achieve something more can i type better can i learn new programs and, and, and are they with me in it one of the mistakes that we oftentimes make is we just assume that the staff just can, can, can operate without us. Well, that's usually a mistake. Nobody wants to do their profession without the, their leader approving it and supporting it, right? Their will won't be disposed to go the extra mile or even to be faithful and disciplined in doing their jobs without some help, right? That help comes when, when I realize deep within I've got to get them to want it. Well, I'll tell you a great way to get them to want it. In, in most cases, it's by helping them to see that you want it as well. Not just the end goal, but the concrete goal that they have in front of them. You got to be with them in one way or the other in their jobs. From congratulating them on jobs well done, to tackling problems with them and helping them to troubleshoot, to being interested, to making sure that, that they have the little things that are actually the big things, especially if it's an office staff. I mean, just think, for example, about the quality of coffee that you put out, right? I mean, it's a small little thing, but it says a lot. The gifts that you could give uh, from time to time for celebrations, the, the way that you stop in the morning to have a morning huddle. If you pray with your team, the, the, the fact that you pray together, that you remember the details of their life. The more detached the leader is, the more removed the leader is from the people that are following them and from what they have to do every day, the less motivated the followers become. It's a, it's a incredible thing. It's the same with a parent. It's the same with a spouse. We got to remember when we assume the mantle of leadership, we're assuming a, a difficult thing. We have to be concerned, not just with nailing our goals, but with helping the people who are helping us to nail their goals as well. You have to do both. It's just one of those paradoxes. You were so good at what you did that now you can only do it half time. Because the other half the time, you're helping other people to become good at what they're doing. A great business will always end up being a leadership school for the people who are working for the business. It's just, it, it's just the way it is. You're really good at playing the violin. And the next thing you have to do is help everyone, encourage everyone around you who is helping to schedule concerts for you, help you to move your violins, help you to, you're working with your people. But a great thing happens when you do that. The people then become disposed to action. When you're being led effectively, you have no problem doing what your leader is leading you to do. You see, because you're, you're engaged with the will. And it goes the same then. There's another trick that we need to learn. And Thomas gives us, Thomas Aquinas gives us about the mind. That the act of command is not just one of the will, but also one of reason. And I want to get into that as well. Would you like to start your Thursday mornings with a scriptural leadership lesson? Join the St. John Leadership Network, where Father Nathan hosts a 30-minute call at 6.30 a.m. in all four U.S. time zones. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. And in anything that we do in our human life, there's always going to be this strange paradox. One thing is being able to do something well, and an entirely other thing is doing what you do well with the help of others. The reason for this is that as soon as you move into doing what you do well with the help of others, you now have to have a whole nother skill set called working with other people, called leadership. Doing what you do well isn't leadership, but doing, helping other people, working with other people, helping your team to form so that they can help you to do what you do well. Ah, suddenly, we, all of our weaknesses are going to come out or end all of our greatnesses, right? I mean, every aspect of who we are is going to be seen and felt because we're now impacting a team of people around us. And Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic scholar, can help us to understand how to do this well because he writes about the act of command, the act whereby we pass from thinking things about things and making plans into actually doing the deed. 
And ma many, many people suffer from not being able to do that command, from not being able to seem to, to move from planning into action. And we see it, right? We see it in husbands that don't mow the lawn. We see it in mothers that just never do the laundry, right? We see it in kids that just play video games, you know, without stopping. We see it in young adults that refuse to get a job, right? It, it's hard to do. But if we could solve for it, we could tap that potential that's inside of every human being and bring it to great consequence, all right? So that's what we're trying to do. And in the first part here, we looked at how Thomas says, the act of command is an act of the will. You've, you, the people need to want to work for you. And that one very important step to that is the proximity between the leader and them. Does the leader care enough about what they have to do to, to help them to be disposed to want it as well? But the other side of it is that the act of command is also an act of reason. And this is a really important thing that the, the mind of the worker, the mind of the person, the child, the spouse, whoever it is you're trying to influence, needs to have clarity about what it is they're trying to do. Clarity, not just in terms of specificity, but also clarity in terms of how it's connected to their greater good. There needs to be, in other words, emphasis by the leader, whatever it is, manager, executive, owner, or whoever it might be, parent, on connecting the hard thing that has to be accomplished with the end goal of the fulfillment of the person who is to accomplish it. All right, that's an education. So there's work to be done, in other words, around clarity of the explaining the why. All right, so this, of course, is a classic scenario for parents, right? Because, gosh, you can't do this all the time. If you try to do this all the time, you'll go crazy. That's for sure. But at the same time, we see its value, right? Because if I can help my, my people to understand that by doing this, we're going to effectively reach our goal and, f and narrow in from all the different risk factors, all the different emotional factors in the equation to a very specific action, will be able to command that activity from them with even greater decisiveness and power. A person will engage with simplicity. The simpler the message, the greater the focus, the fewer obstacles can come up to cloud the direction. So it's, it's obviously a balancing act because you don't want to treat your people like robots. And it's not, that's why specificity is only one part of it. It's also the connection. If we hit these objectives, we're going to arrive at these goals. And if we hit these goals, we're going to be opening ourselves to these results. My goodness, that's a very persuasive and powerful thing. Some people don't operate well if they don't have a map in front of them. They want to know where they've come from and where they're going. And, and, and that act of the Imperium, that's because of that. I can say do something and I will do something more easily and with greater result when I understand why I'm doing it, right? So those two kind of wings, on the one hand, that help the, the proximity between the leader and those being led in terms of passion and care and being involved with what they have to do each day. That's the disposing of the will and then the disposing of the mind by both a, specific, a specificity, a focus, this is what I need you to do, and also an understanding of the why behind it. And of course, we understand where all of this flows from our Christian faith. I mean, our Christian faith is a faith of action. And Jesus himself shows us very specifically, whatever you did to the least of my brothers, that you did to me. Right? When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was sick you know, or imprisoned, you visited me. I mean, he, he really like spells it out there. Very specific what he's looking for from us. And he even says, at the end of your days, this is what you'll be judged on. Okay, right? Because whatever you didn't do to the least of your brethren, that you didn't do to me. So not only is he specific, do this. He also links it to the profound why. Do this so that you will be saved. Come to eternal life. He even describes the reward. I will say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. You know, sit upon my right. You know, so there's like a blessing there. So I understand why it's good for me. And then he disposes our will by showing us the example. 
at the Last Supper. He gets, he takes his, his outer garment off. He puts an apron around his waist and he washes his disciples' feet. And he says, as I have done to you, so you too must do to one another. And he demonstrates his proximity to us. He says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, wherever two or three of you are gathered, there am I in the midst of you. Each one of us feels motivated by Christ to live for him when we know that he's within us. The more that he, you develop your spirituality into a lived encounter with Jesus, the easier it is to act like a Christian, to forgive your enemies, to forgive your friends, right? To, to be humble about your, your, your life, to be detached from the goods of this world. All those things that you might struggle with, but you know you need to do, become easy when you know that Jesus cares and Jesus is watching and Jesus wants to be with you, right? And then he specifically says what to do. Go to mass on Sunday. Go to confession once a year. Tithe to, the ch to charity. Give to the church. You know, all these different things that we, we have lined up in front of us, they become really specific and clear with a great why. And this is what transforms our spirituality. And where your work every day, could you imagine if you took what you did every day and your need for this imperium, right? This command that you recognize because you have to work every day with your people. What if you were to apply that to your faith? I say, my goodness, why is it that in my workplace, I have to hit objectives to hit goals, but yet I refuse to lay down certain steps for myself to take in order to progress spiritually. What if I took that same discipline of making an annual plan and I put it to myself spiritually and in my family? And this is how I'm going to increase my relationship with my 18 year old daughter. This is where I'm going to be a stronger presence as a father in the home. I'm going to do the following steps to get there. Well, I mean, you, you would get there, right? Just like it works in the workplace, it also works in your personal life. And in each of those steps, you're laying out a, a pathway for your power of command to express itself more fully. And I just think with our faith, we need to take as seriously that power of command to transform our families, our workspaces, and our world by God's love because we put ourselves effectively into action. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at communications at stjohninstitute.org. That's communications at stjohninstitute.org. And visit www.stjohninstitute.org and sign up for our newsletter to receive updates from Father Nathan.